Heavenly Father, we certainly do surrender all, all to Thee, our blessed Savior. We surrender all to You. Oh God, once again, we approach your throne of grace. So excited that you still entertain our petitions, our prayers, our pleas. So many times, oh God, this week, we have fallen short of your glory. But so many times this week as well, you forgave us, you covered us, and you kept us in your loving embrace. And so on a day in which Myra and I are just testifying about the second time around, a time that you have allowed for the two of us to be united in holy matrimony, not just for purposes of our union with you, but to set a precedence among all the people who witnessed our marriage and who have experienced us since we have been wholly wedded. That our union with all the lumps and the bumps of it and all the victories and all the triumphs is representative of your glorious, matchless mercy and grace. Three and a half years we have been on this journey and three and a half years, we praise you that you united us. Have there been days where things have been a little tough? Absolutely. Have there been times where maybe the thought that what have I done popped into both of our hearts? Probably. But oh God, you are the foundation which keeps us together through the thick and thin, through the good and the bad, through the challenges and the triumphs. You are holy God. And we thank you we thank you, we thank you, and we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, who is the living example of holiness and righteousness in human form. Knowing that even when he departed this earth in the natural, you provided through him the Holy Spirit who would always be our reminder to help us to get back in remembrance of all the glorious things that you have done. We honor you, O oh God, with the fruit of our lips and with the countenance and substance of our hearts. We approach the throne of grace in humility and in love, knowing that we can only give love to you because you first showed us the example of love. Father, we give you all the glory we give you all the honor and we give you all the praise. And it is in the name 
of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah and amen. Oh, I see you, Justin. God bless you. God bless you. Well, everybody, we are here again two weeks in a row. Got my sugar cookie riding side by side uh, with us once again. We continue to ask for your prayers concerning her uh, as far as her health. Uh, you know, you never know what people are going through. So you never want to take it for granted when um, the people of God are before you and um, to just encourage them. Even if they don't say anything is wrong, always know that people that have dedicated their lives to the service of Jesus Christ always appreciate a prayer. Amen. Amen. And so um, I'm going to move swiftly um, because we have some things that we need to take care of. Um, the first thing that I want to do before I turn things over to my beloved is to first of all, why are you laughing? I am laughing. <laughs> I have no idea how this is going to go. <laughs> well, neither do I. This is truly um, not rehearsed, but um, I do have to honor a conviction of mine, which has always been to bring information to you all in prayerfully with integrity and consistency with the word of God. And on last Sunday, I made a faux pas. I made a mistake um, when I was actually sharing some things, some comments after Sugar Cookie here um, was talking about uh, the book of Hebrews and had gone into mentioning, um, you know, uh, both, uh, oh gosh, Cain and, Cain and Abel. My gosh, I'm getting ready to do it again. Um, but in the midst of my um, response to her and to you all, um, I see you, Ladybug. God bless you. God bless you. Um, in response to what she shared last week, I did what I was almost getting ready to do today, which is I always blend the brothers in the Old Testament. So while she was talking about Cain and Abel, I was there with her too with Cain and Abel with the things I actually shared that meant something. But um, I happened to slip in some conversation that dealt with birthrights. And that birthright conversation was, of course, Jacob and Esau. And so... I have to take it, um, as we say in my house, uh, I have to own what I did, and I blended the stories a little bit, but um, the foundation of what was shared overall is true, and what Sugar Cookie was talking about and what I'm going to say once again is that the struggle between Cain and Abel consisted of their offerings unto the Lord. And one offering was considered to be worthy and the other not so worthy. But you know, our God is faithful and he's just. If there had been an admittance right up front, everything would have been okay. But as my wife so eloquently shared last week, there ended up being a murder that took place. We believe the first murder that was actually, at least the first human murder that was actually accounted for in the Bible. So again, beloveds, please accept my apology because what we try to do here is to, again, share the truth, the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we ever find ourselves in error, you can best believe we will be the first ones that will come and publicly uh, beg your mercy and forgiveness. And so that is what's happening now. So again, God bless you. And I thank you so much for hanging with us. And we're going to go ahead and get things started. I'm going to kind of lower this music here because we're going to set up 
Sugar Cookie. And just in case y'all don't know who Sugar Cookie is, she is sitting right next to me. Um, it is a name that uh, we, we were watching the movie, and I won't give all the details about that, but um, it was mentioned in the movie, and I haven't been able to let it go since. So she is Sugar Cookie around here. <laughs> Amen. It allows us to praise the Lord and at the same time to give honor to my wife. <laughs> so I love it because the worship of God is really just a love song unto him. And that love song can also translate or transfer to those people that are close to us. And so I want to go ahead. I see you, Maxine. I see you, Carolyn. God bless you both. I'm trying to work the technology and everything. So here we go. I'm waving at you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of set things up. And then uh, I'm going to allow a sugar cookie to go ahead and to do what she does so well. So this week, uh, scripture lesson or anything like that. But we have never really had the opportunity to share our love story in this kind of a setting. Uh, we've gone to places, we've gone to church conventions and things of that nature. We've been in groups and we've shared it. And one of us, and you can probably guess who, has been very animated in the way that 
he <laughs> shares the story. But today we're going to really just um, talk about it honestly because if you're watching with us now, you'll see that this is under a title that's called The Second Time Around. And just to give you all a setup, both Sugar Cookie and I have been married before. And I know that in the Christian community, a lot of people have their thoughts on remarriage and what goes along with it. We're not getting into that today. We are very confident that God has ordained this union because we acknowledge that the first time around for us was not really sanctioned by the Lord. Even though we did it in his presence, he did not really receive that because we were not his children and we did not acknowledge him as our God. Mm -hmm. But now, three and a half years later, we stand as a couple who, if nothing else, we know that this is it for us. This is going to work because there are no other options. And so we wanted to just give you guys a taste of our marriage, our story. And again, it's under the heading of the second time around. And with that, I'm shutting up and beloved, it's yours. Oh my, I didn't even know he was gonna do this because he's the better speaker than I am. But um, we had met a few years ago uh, at a missions conference, actually at Colonial. And only he and I were in the room. And I just went over to his, his table display and introduced myself. And he started telling me about water projects and things he was doing. I'm like, oh, okay. And I went back to my corner, that was it. And a few years later, um, from the same church, they uh, communicated with him um, about me because he had been doing some uh, help in ministry in different countries, especially Africa, and that was the time uh, where there was the Ebola. And uh, so he was looking for some other avenues to help. And he said somewhere in the Americas, so the leader of the ministry of uh, missions there said, do you know a little sister, Myra uh, Smith? And he said, no. So they, they introduced him to me and he, communicated me by email and told me about the things that he could buy. And I had a school and I needed some computers and he was able to provide those things. And in the interim, I came home, I think it was 2015. Um, my dad had had a fall and I came home for about a month and stayed with him. And during that time we met uh, face to face, we went out um, and had uh, a dinner with his uh, co-founder Paul, and um, I was impressed with him right away because he opened the door for me, <laughs> and then in our conversations, we must I must have said something about I like jazz, and he had on jazz music, and I said, "You like jazz?" He said, "Yeah, you told me." And I'm like, "Oh, okay," but it was just like uh, this is a really nice man. So we had our meeting about the ministry and what they could do for us. And he brought, us, brought me back home and, and that was it. And I went back to Guatemala and uh, uh, sadly my father's health um, didn't improve. Uh, he um, got worse and he wound up going into the hospital and then into hospice the following year, which is 2016. So I put out on Facebook that my dad um, was sick and be praying for him. And um, he went, he asked me about what hospital was at. By that time, my dad was in hospice. And he went to hospice and he prayed with my dad. He got gave him communion. I'm like, who is this man? My family were there and they were like, who is this man? <laughs> and I just said, he's just a really nice man. But I was like, wow, I mean, he is really walking out the Christian walk. Because we had just met. It was, you know, nothing between us at all. And um, so I wrote him a thank you. Uh, my dad passed away uh, in March. I came home the first day of March. 
and went to the hospice and he died within 20 minutes of my arrival. They always said he was waiting for me, bless his heart. And um, I had planned to stay home for a month because I didn't know how that was, you know, what we'd have to do. So my mom had passed away a couple years earlier and it took a while to get her grave site. But since it was already established within a week, we had the funeral. And I, to help my sister, um, Janice and Sheila, and I, we divided up responsibilities. So I said, I'll, I'll arrange the church. And um, one of the churches that support me, uh, Huber Memorial, uh, agreed to allow me to have the, the funeral there because my church is all the way in Silver Spring, all the families here. It was just more convenient and I, I'm very thankful for them for allowing me to do that. And then I was looking for somebody to do music and I didn't know anybody and he recommended Jamila and she came. <laughs> and she's and, with us now. And she's with us now. <laughs> and that's how, I, well, I met Jamila that way. And I mean, he just really helped me a lot. He even came to the funeral. And by this time, he got up and started sharing about how he met my dad and he's such an excellent speaker. In the funeral, my sisters were hunching me saying, he likes you. I said, no, no, he's just a nice man. He doesn't, you know, he, he's just a nice man. And he went back to work. And um, while I was home, Colonial was still having their missions conference. So I said, I may as well go to the conference. He was at the conference, he was at the activities. Uh, they asked me to speak at one of the uh, weekly sessions and he was there and we prayed together. And by this time, I was like, oh my goodness, this is such a nice man. But he never said anything to me. And I was like, the Lord had told me my husband was going to pursue me. And that's another story. But my, my, the Lord had told me years ago that I was going to get married again. And that, um, what did I want? And I said, I want a man that would love the Lord with all his heart, mind, and soul. Would love me as Christ loved the church. Want to live in Guatemala. Be mission-minded. Love children. And would cherish me. And it's like, that was it. And the Lord spoke to me over the years and said, he's going to pursue you. He wasn't pursuing me, so I was like, I just left it alone. So we arranged um, for him to come down that June and bring a small group. And he came with um, Jamila and her husband, uh, a couple other people, um, one from a number, of the, actually the daughter of uh, the pastor, Anderson, from Colonial, and who was the other person? It was Naomi. Now, our <laughs> Just our child. Oh, God. <laughs> our daughter, Naomi. Sorry, Naomi, hope you weren't hearing that. Anyway. <laughs> oh, boy. So, her birthday's coming up, guys, so you're going to have to really take care of her now. I sure <laughs> so, we picked them up at the airport, and they had left very early, like 2 o'clock in the morning. They were tired, and we picked them up like midday. And you know, there's like a two hours difference. So it, it had been a long trip for them. We started talking on the, on the bus. And we talked for four hours, because it's a four-hour trip. Mm. And he just made me laugh. And it was just like, okay. So then we got to, to the, uh, the ministry site. And they were there for about a week. And... Um, I really didn't see them that much because we were busy. They were doing activities. They were, you know, uh, ministering. They were doing activities with the kids, and we were visiting other churches. So we really didn't interact that much. Then on the way back to um, the capital, we stopped off at Antigua, which is a place where they can relax and buy uh, souvenirs. And we talked the whole way again for four hours going back. No, actually, yeah, it was four hours because Antigua was a little bit further so it might have been five and we never stopped talking so we got to Antigua by this time my daughter my other, our other daughter Amy was with us and she said mom I'm going to ask him I think he likes you I'm going to ask him if he likes you I said don't do that stop he doesn't like me he's just a, a nice man and anyway we were at breakfast uh, in Antigua and he got some kind of fruity tea and I got another one but it was a different flavor and I just said, um, can I try your tea? And he looked at me and he said, can I try yours? And it was almost like no one else was there but us. And it was like one of those moments that suspended. Everybody was like, what's going on here? So that was like the beginning of acknowledging there was, there was some kind of attraction. 
and then uh, we went they went shopping and, and I've been there a lot so I didn't want to go and my daughter took them shopping and I came out of my room and he was sitting in the like a little sitting area outside the room and and we I sat down and we we really talked I mean we weren't laughing we really seriously started talking about our lives and and um, just it was serious and he said to me um, I need to go home and pray and change some things in my life or something like that and I'm like really and I I don't know what I blurted out something like I'd make a good wife and he he jumped he said really I'm like it was like why did I say that <laughs> it was just like one of those I don't know moments that God knew that we needed to communicate in that kind of way that night um, we had um, opportunity I had opportunity to pray for everyone which I do sometimes when when, when groups come they're not that big so I went to each of the rooms. Him and Naomi had a room together, and I went in and I prayed with her, and then I prayed with him. And um, after I prayed, I looked at him and I said, "I don't recommend this." I said, "I really like you," and he said, "I like him too." And Naomi's going like, "What's going on here?" <laughs> so then I went into the other room with Paul and Jamila, and I said, "Please pray for me. I really like Mac," because I didn't know what was going on. And and her husband was like, "Duh." Like, he didn't know what was, you know, or the wife went, I sure will, you know. <laughs> so we went to the airport mm. the next day and we we didn't kiss anything and um at the airport I arranged it that he and I would take the last picture together. I, I did that. I did that. And they left and when they got to the in, in the States I sent all of them a text like welcome them back to their home and he text me back and when I opened up Facebook there was the picture my son-in-law had put it on Facebook of him and I and with like a hundred comments like you all look good together like, like what mm. and from that moment on he never stopped communicating with me he always sent me a text and then he started talking kind of romantically and I was like wait a minute you know you know you know what's going on and after about a month or so, he, he told me over the phone, I love you. And I hung up because I didn't know how to respond. And then I texted him back and said, I love you too. And from that point on, he, he never really proposed. He just, you know, he said, we're too old to wait, you know. So we're getting married. And I went, okay. I mean, he was pursuing me. And the, one of the first things he said to me was, God is number one in my life. And that was, that was the number one thing on my list. And then he said to me somewhere in, I don't know exactly when, he said, I will cherish you all the days of my life. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, and he said, I'm willing to live in Guatemala. I mean, everything that I prayed for, he was it. And I was like, okay. Um, then I went into a tailspin, like, with, with doubt. Because it was like, Honestly, I had never been loved like that before. With the security of knowing that, you know, I've been married before and my husband was, my ex-husband was a, a, a good man, but he, he wasn't saved, so there were issues in his life to be a, a husband and even a father at that time. Um, but, and I'd had relationships with one, one other man that was very important to me. But he never made a commitment. My husband deserted me for you know other women, and the other man never made the commitment. So I never had been loved. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just it would just never happen. And this man is saying, "I love the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm going to love you. I'm cherishing you. I'll live with you in Guatemala. I'm going to give up everything to to be with you. I'm not going to take you away from your ministry. I can do my ministry anywhere." And I was like, and I went to God and I said, are you sure? <laughs> and he, he just spoke to my heart said, Myra, I have given you everything you asked for. And I've had struggle. I really did for a little bit. And I, I, I even went away to a conference. And uh, in the conference, uh, one of the speakers was talking from James, talking about being double-minded. And, and he said something about, when's the last time God told you something and 
and you would listen and God kind of not spoke to you anymore. And I'm like, oh, here I am. He said, well, you better get up and ask forgiveness and go and, 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 and walk in the way God wants you to. And I knew that was for me. I don't care how many other people stood up, but that was for me. And it was just, it was just fear. It was just natural fear. And, and being vulnerable and being hurt again and being disappointed. So I came back home after that and, you know, it, it affected him because he was saying, what's wrong? What's wrong? He, he hadn't done anything wrong. And I, I got off the bus and I, he said, is there anything you need to tell me? I said, nope, I'm going to show you. And I was fine from after that point. So I just thank God for the way he helped me to, you know, accept the gift that he had for me. I prayed for a husband for over 25 years. But I didn't sit there and wait for him. I just kept on going to, you know, whatever God called me to do, I just went. And occasionally I'd meet somebody or see someone and I'd ask, he said, no. But I never dated. I, I didn't have sexual relationships with anyone. I even prayed. I said, God, I don't want to have a relationship with anyone because I don't want to disgrace you. There was one other man in my life before I met him that was a, a, a pastor and he helped me to open up to being, you know, to accept love because at that point I had shut myself down and he helped me to see that I still had something to give, that I was capable of loving on someone and being loved. But that wasn't the man for me because he didn't choose me. But we, we weren't involved in anything, but it was something to hope open my heart so that when the, the man came along that was for me, I could accept it because I had just kind of like turned everything off as far as emotions and being a woman that anyone would love. I mean, that sounds silly, but we put ourselves through a whole lot of stuff for nothing. But God had a plan. I mean, it was so beautifully set up. I mean, because I had actually said one time, I'm going to get married again. You better send an angel to my door with a, a, a card that has the man's name, address, and everything. Well, he did better than that. <laughs> he, I had the list of what I wanted in a husband. The main thing that loved the Lord would love me as Christ loved the church and died for her, willing to live in Guatemala, willing to um, uh, give up everything, which he basically did to, to do that, love children, have a heart for mission. He definitely has the heart for mission because he's opened up things for me in missions that I, I would never have been able to touch because of his ministry, would pursue me and cherish me. And that cherishing was very, very important to me. And when he said that to me, it was like, there was that card from the angel, but it was, I had the list and God fulfilled everything in that list. And then from that point on, we were planning our marriage and things went kind of downhill. <laughs> we, we, we got some obstacles. Um, his mom got sick. Um, he got sick. Um, his job wasn't working where he could uh, continue to work remotely in, in another country. By the time we planned to get married in March of 2017, uh, he actually said to me, do you want to postpone it? Or, I said, no. And I asked him the same thing. No, I asked oh, wait, man. Well, I asked you, you, you asked me, right. Asked you. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff going on in his <laughs> life, with his illness, with his mom's uh, illness. And he said, no. And I said, okay. And, and, and somewhere in there, you kind of asked me, did I want to like, oh, I don't remember that part, yeah. but that's okay. And I said, no, we're going to go ahead and, and do it. And we, so we were both in agreement. Mm. And we got married in, in March of 2017 at a beautiful, at uh, Emmanuel's Church, which was my sending church in Silver Spring. And I had my dress made in Guatemala, and it was, it was beautiful, handmade. And, and I had my bouquet and my hat and everything with a little veil. Made in Guatemala, it cost me $100. It would have cost thousands of dollars here. Um, I had my one of my good friends, Carolyn Green, friend now, Carolyn Friend, who 
she just planned everything. She did the catering, she did the decoration with her sister, Valerie, and some of the young people from the church bought in uh, uh, meat platters. Only thing I paid for was the cake because I didn't want to bother him with anything. I paid for the cake. It was the most inexpensive, beautiful wedding that you can imagine. About 250 people showed up because I'm sure everyone wanted to see who is Mama and Mary? You know, <laughs> after all those years. It was wonderful. We danced, we sang. It was, it was, it was a fairy tale. It was a fairy tale. And even someone, a friend of mine who's a missionary, gave us her house in Florida to stay for a week and we just flew down there and her house was on a lake mm. in, in Naples, Florida. It was like, God just showered us with blessings after blessings after blessings. And then we moved in and started really having a marriage. You want to go on from there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, actually, that's, that's a pretty good point uh, for me to kind of chime in. So, um, my part of this story, um, I have to go back a little bit because um, what Myra didn't know at the time was that by the time I had really uh, gotten to know her, this is well before marriage, I was just getting comfortable in being alone. So she was way ahead of me, um, having been at that point, I think it was about 40 years. 40 years. 40 years. Yeah. And, and um, I hadn't even been, uh, um, you know, really free for 40 months. <laughs> so um, my problem was really the way that the first marriage uh, ended, it broke my heart because I never ever intended to ever be divorced. I mean, I took my, well, let me put it this way. I took my vows seriously as I began to understand them because the first time around, just like she and her uh, former husband, um, we were not saved. Uh, and, um, you know, so the whole marriage, and it was 27 years compared to four years with her the first time around. But I was in that for 27 years in marriage, but um, even more years as just friends and dating and stuff like that because I literally met the first wife when I was 13 years old. So that was a lot of history that ended, you know, so many years ago. And so my issues in the beginning were that I was just extremely lonely. And honestly, it wasn't really for sex. It was just for companionship. I just missed having a presence around me. And what that did, even with the things that I knew about God and what God would want for my life, I made some very bad choices prior to you where <clears throat> I was trying to take relatively good women because the women that I did uh, at least pursue, there was nothing wrong with them for the most part. Um, but it was me. It was me because I was looking for the biblical definition of a wife. And unfortunately, I was trying to fit my expectations into women that could never fulfill them. And that wasn't their problem. That was my problem. So I'm saying all that to say without really getting into the weeds of that is that by the time that I was ready to go on this mission trip to Guatemala, I was actually for the first time in my life, I was okay 
with no girlfriend, no thoughts of any kind of relationship, and definitely not marriage by that point. And so I'm on this trip. I had my daughter with me, and I'm just saying, hey, I'm just going to go out because now I can just, you know, go and pursue the ministry without having to not having to worry about clocking in with somebody and I could just live my life. I was basically trying to be the apostle Paul. Well, you know what? Now it's just me and God. <laughs> and I was truly, truly good with that. But as we know, God had a different plan. And what she was talking about on that trip from the airport in Guatemala all the way to where she stayed, which she's right, three to four hours, closer to four hours with traffic, is that I really would have been asleep. <laughs> but girlfriend right here, now beloved wife, is the one who kept me awake. Um, and I always joke and I said, she went for my social security number, my driver's license information. She wanted everything. I'm just teasing. But but we did. We started to really talk. Um, and very fortunately, everybody else other than our driver were asleep. So we could freely just exchange and, and really have a great conversation. And she pulled a whole lot of stuff out of me. I'm talking about a whole lot of stuff. Going back, I think, even to my teenage days. I'm like, my God, what am I doing here? <laughs> so anyway, uh, everything else, I won't really touch on the, the other things that she accounted for um, because they all ring basically true. Um, I knew that when I left Guatemala on that first trip, I knew that there was a serious decision that I was going to have to make. And I'm going to tell you guys, when I got off the, uh, off the plane in the U.S. and was finally able to get a signal on my phone, and as many of us do, we're flipping automatically to social media, so I went right to Facebook, and the very picture that our son-in-law took was the one that greeted me and I saw all these comments from her side and my side and I'm going like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I just knew that that had to be God. And, and so it took me about a month and I was just, you know, really I was just contemplating it because again, guys, the first marriage was 27 years. I know what it takes, you know. I know what I did wrong in the first one. I know what went wrong in the first one. And so it was a, a situation of not trying to repeat the same mistakes with a, a innocent. And so um, to her advantage and to my advantage, God means everything to us. So there was a lot of pressure that honestly was taken off of me as a man because, you know, in this world now, a lot of times uh, the expectation to maybe uh, do some things from a sexual uh, perspective are sometimes really forced more by women than the guys. And so, you know, I knew that I was going to take a stand that there would be no canoodling <laughs> um, before we got married. And, and I, was, I was serious about that because, again, I wanted for Myra and I to have a true first time under the right circumstances, in the right environment with the true and living God. And... I'm telling you, and I'm just saying this, I'm going to just come out of this testimony just for a moment, just to encourage you guys that the best decision that we ever made, because our first night was fabulous. And I'm not just talking about just sex. I'm just talking about the newness of 
a relationship, the unveiling of our bodies before one another, where unlike Adam and Eve after sin, where they felt naked and ashamed, we were not really naked and ashamed. Well, I don't think we were naked and ashamed. <laughs> but, um, you know, it just made all the sense in the world to wait and allow God to be the leader of our family. And he stands as the leader of our family to this very day. <clears throat> and it was very difficult because she is right as far as there were many challenges. I basically had three different issues within the, a year. Um, one was um, I got a stomach ulcer and that tore me up. <clears throat> Another one that literally affected our wedding was um, I got Bell's palsy. And if you know anything about Bell's palsy, um, it literally um, is where you, um, your, your muscles, uh, most of the time in your face, they literally stop functioning. And even to this day, I'm still dealing with that issue. It never really got back. It has affected my hearing. It's affected my singing, my speaking voice. Like you hear me now, I'm kind of dry throat. It has affected so many things. But in our marriage, as we were preparing for our wedding, my face was crooked and I was like, oh my God, Myra. I think that's probably what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so that makes sense. Because I didn't know if she wanted to go through with the wedding because of my crooked face. And to her credit, she made me feel so good that it was what I needed to hear. She just encouraged me and it's going to be all right. And, and it really was all right. Um, so anyway, so that was the, you know, those were two ailments. But then <laughs> not too long after our uh, our wedded day, then I had a heart attack and ended up having triple bypass. And that was a major challenge in our marriage that was really just getting off the ground. And I'm not going to get into the, the details, but it was during that time where we really learned some of the not so good things about us. Um, but our God is able and he allowed us to work through those challenges. And I can say enough to say that actually it was me not being sensitive enough to allow her to love me and care for me. Because I'm like, I'm good, you know, let's keep it moving. That's, that's just the nature of who I am. And, you know, it affected both of us right at the start of our marriage. The other thing that affected us was the fact that, like she said, I had an expectation that my job at that time would actually allow me to be able to work remotely overseas. And so, I was at that point even willing to go back and forth because basically I was going to give up my home in the States, the money that I was uh, spending to, to do and take care of that home, that could be my travel money so that I wasn't asking my job to pay my way. I would just live sometimes in Guatemala and then come back as needed uh, in the States. And Long story short, it just did not work out. And God dealt with me concerning that because for the first, what was it, about year and a half or so, a good year and a half of our marriage, there were long periods of time where we were living separately. Now, we stayed in touch every day, but we weren't in the same place, not even the same country every day. She had more flexibility than me, so she could spend a month or two in the States, but then she had to go back, and then I'm on my own. 
I could come for, you know, two weeks or so, and then I had to go back. And that was how we were living. We spent a lot of money going back and forth. But it just got to a point where God dealt with me and said, you know what? If you trust me, know that I'm going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. There was one thing that was hindering us being together in the same house. And that was that career that I had spent 35 years building up. And it was that career that I had to finally make a decision and retire from. And I'm telling you guys, it's the best decision that I've ever made. Not because I'm throwing any shade to my company or my, my former company. It's not about that. It's about the fact that I'm now truly living on the provision of God. And God has kept his promise to keep us. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to throw any kind of prosperity gospel at you, but we literally now have two residences, you know, with the COVID-19, we're literally, we would have been in Guatemala now, but we're stuck here, <laughs> um, you know, not able to get back home. And we're praying that we can actually get back home in December, back to Guatemala. We're praying for another thing that's coming up that we can actually travel to that as well. But suffice it to say that God has taken care of both of us. And the reason why we wanted to title this the second time around is because the second time around, we are united in truly holy matrimony. There, there's no secrets now. There's no uh, hidden things that we don't know about what marriage means. So we have to make our union work. We have to support one another, love one another, cherish <laughs> one another, you know, encourage one another because... This is all we have. Divorce with what we know now and who we are committed to is no longer an option in this house. Forgive one another. Ah, perfect. Forgive one another mm -hmm. at the top of that list. And so we wanted to take a moment and just come out here and share our story. Um, since the bypass surgery, uh, we've traveled to Rwanda, to the Congo. We, of course, we're always back and forth out of Guatemala. Um, and we have some other things. I want to put it all out there today, but we have some other locations that are set up prayerfully for 2021. And so we're going to do that together. And <laughs> makes me think about actually, um, I was supposed to be in Malawi in June, June, July. Mm -hmm. And it was through this organization called Pomoza. And, and the reason I'm thinking about Pomoza is because M Pomoza is uh, Malawian hopefully I'm saying that correct, uh, for together. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing everything Pomoza. So for Tim Wong Wright, we're promoting uh, Pomoza International right now. But seriously, guys, um, our marriage is a work in progress. In all things, we are really still learning one another. We did not, what well, we did not say, we really did not date. <laughs> we, I think we went to a dinner. One, My birthday. A birthday dinner. Mm -hmm. One birthday dinner yeah. that was actually social. But outside of that, it was just a decision. And the reason why I told her that we shouldn't just mess around and, and we should go ahead and get married is because when God has already revealed that 
your, your spouse is right in front of you, what is there to think about? It's just, there was just no reason to, to have to think about it. What are we going to date? What are we going to figure out? We both love God. And that's, that was the, the, the biggest the biggest hurdle. So I don't have to, you know, encourage her to be saved and, to, you know, commit to Christ. We don't have to go through all that. So all it was about for us was making sure that we could do this marriage and be harmonious. With Sorry, guys. Um, but we now look at our marriage as this three layered thing that works out into a braid. And that is sugar cookie, myself and God. And it is unbreakable. And any of you all that know anything about a braid, that once you put those three strands together and you tighten it up, it takes a force of nature to try to break it up or to uh, unravel it. So that's who we are today. Again, I know that this is not a, a preach message or a taught message like we normally do, but we felt like in the midst of the so much um, anxiety and mm -hmm. so much uh, confusion that is taking place because of COVID-19, because of racial discord. We wanted to really come out here and show you guys that love is real. Love exists, love is here, love is God, and love is understanding our roles as man and woman, as husband and wife, and our roles as servants of God co-laborers with Jesus Christ and definitely ministers of reconciliation. With that said, beloved, is there anything else you need to say? As soon as you said we're not going to, didn't have a scripture, the scripture came. <laughs> when we first got married on our invitation, um, the scripture came from Psalms 37, sorry, 37, 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. We say that all the time, but that was the scripture. Because I remember when, years ago, when God had uh, spoken to me about what I wanted in a husband. At the time, a lot of my friends uh, were doing the naming and claiming, and they were going like, I want tall, dark, handsome, money in the bank, and all that. And... I had to ask myself, are you really delighting in the Lord? Mm. And and I said, and I don't think so. I need to do better. So by the time he got around to talking to me about a marriage, a husband, I felt I could answer him and say, I'm fine. He said, what do you want, Myra? I'm fine. I've got you. I'm, I have everything I need. And then that's when he told me, you can have that husband. Although it took number of years, 40 years, but that's, that was his promise. But since I've been married, this other scripture has meant more to me. Because of some of the struggles we've gone through, and it's also Psalm 37, but it's right ahead of it. It says, 37.3, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. For me, I'm trusting in God for this marriage. Dwell on the land, I'm not going anywhere. And I'm not feeding off of my husband. I'm feeding off of the faithfulness of God. And I'm trusting in him to keep us. But he said, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Because he's faithful in everything. That has been what I've been standing on for most of this marriage. God can always give us what we need to hear. Because what I do if, if I'm struggling, I go to the Lord. And sometimes I'll say, for this, 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 
I'm learning to just sit because he knows what I'm going through. And he never fails but to give me exactly what he wants, what his heart says. And it's my choice to listen to him or to listen to my own flesh. I choose to listen to him because he's faithful. He knows, he knows this man better than I do. And if he has not shown me anything else, he loves me. He may not say it all the time, but he loves me. And that is something too precious to try for. And it sustains my heart because God promised me that my husband would love me. But most of all, he promised me my husband would love him. And his love to men enables him to love me. And that, that can't be broken. That can't be false. That can't fall away because God is in charge of his heart. And I know how much he loves the Lord and how much he listens. So because of, he's talking about crookedness because of his the bell's crossing, there may be some crookedness in his mouth that, that he speaks, but his heart has to overcome that because God is in charge. And that's the same for me. I'm not like him. I'm, I'm not going to blurt out things usually. But my heart may be saying something. So God works in my heart and God works in his heart. And it looks differently, but it comes out the same way. But we wind up living in harmony with respect and love. So I'm dwelling in this land and I'm feeding off of the faithfulness of God. And it tastes so good. <laughs> He 
what's the best for you. Oh God, we glorify you. Oh God, we glorify you.